pour le cobalt collaboratif avec les organisations des Nations Unies. Mais il faut savoir que la plupart des problèmes de santé en Afrique ne trouvent pas leur source dans le domaine de la santé. J'aurais souhaité que ce lien-là soit plus marqué, plus ressorti dans le document pour régler les problèmes de nutrition, d'assainissement de, et autres qui ont des impacts négatifs sur la santé des, des populations. Monsieur le Président, je voudrais enfin qu'on insiste sur un peu plus sur la formation et la qualité des, des ressources humaines, le maintien de ces, ces, ces ressources humaines de qualité dans nos pays pour faire face aux difficultés que nous connaissons. Voilà un peu quelques points que nous tenons à relever, étant entendu que nous allons continuer à regarder le document de fond en comble pour contribuer si nécessaire. Merci, merci Monsieur le Président pour la parole donnée. Thank you, Côte d'Ivoire, for highlighting the need for more in, uh, domestic investment and strengthening the multi-sectoral approach and, of course, training and retention of our own staff that we, we have in Africa. But just notice that at the top table is, is I've got my two vice chairs right at the extreme end, the legal advisor next to me here, and I really like the WHO the DG is here, the DDDG, what do you call it, DDG, DGG is there, and of course the regional director. So it's, this topic is, is important, and I'm glad that you are all here, and the ministers and heads of delegation are fully here. So I think now let's give the floor to the United Republic of Tanzania. Mr. Chairperson, the Tanzanian delegation thanks and applauds the Secretariat for bringing the draft concept note on the 13th program of work spanning the 2019-2023 to the 67th Regional Committee for Consultation. We congratulate the Director General for the already extensive consultations that have been held with staff, partners, and experts in developing the concept note and foundation for this work. We note and appreciate the six areas that propose how WHO will work differently. The focus on outcomes and impact in the results chains is welcome. However, it will need rigorous analysis and thinking to, re to operationalize. We propose that as a results and impact, as results and impact are considered, careful thought will go into the investment, outcomes, and impact required in each WHO region to attain desired goal global results of impact. We strongly endorse the proposal to place countries at the center and World Health Organization becoming more operational. Mr. Chairperson, the development of this general program of work is timely as it gives opportunity for the new Director General to factor his vision for the organization and leadership priorities highlighted during the campaign. While we are cognizant of the DG's five leadership priorities, we propose that some of the leadership priorities for the general program of work may need to be broadened. For example, rather than have women, children, and adolescents as a leadership priority, have health-related strategic development goals then within the SDGs give prominence to women, children, and adolescents. Mr. Chairperson, going forward, Health emergencies will continue to be a priority area for the WHO to address. We need to build on current efforts in development of the health emergencies program and also analyze what progress was achieved with international health regulations as a leadership priority in the 12th program of work identifying what can be done better. While prominence needs to be given to health emergencies, it is important that a balance is maintained with the other priority areas and the normative functions of the World Health Organization. Universal health coverage and the non-communicable diseases were leadership priorities for the 12th general program of work. It is important that we examine what we achieved for universal health coverage and what should be done differently or scaled up as we keep this as a leadership priority going forward. Non-communicable diseases with health-related strategic development goals we need to give prominence as progress, particularly in our region, is very slow. 
while the burden of non-communicable diseases is lower in our region for now than in developing countries, mortality due to non-communicable diseases is rather higher. Mr. Chairperson, we are glad that the Director General has looked into evaluation of the World Health Organization reform and I hope that the new program of work will clearly articulate the key areas where action is required and specifically address the areas of the reform where progress has been slow. We note the, timeline, the timelines and endorse the next steps. In particular, we support the proposal to hold a special session of the Executive Board to discuss the draft on the 22nd to 23rd of November this year of our Lord 2017. In addition, we propose to include consultations with our Geneva-based missions in the next steps. We commit and look forward to engage in the development process in the coming months so that together we own the strategic approach, approach and work of the World Health Organization. For this, Mr. Chairman, I thank you. Um, thank you, Honorable Delegate from the United Republic of Tanzania. And you, you have emphasized the focus on <coughs> countries at the center and that the DG should uh, expand his priorities. There's a suggestion to include uh, women, children, and adolescents. But you highlight health emergencies and uh, that they should be balanced with other priorities. And the, you have endorsed the special session uh, that should be held um, um, and with the agenda program that was suggested in timelines. I will now call upon uh, uh, Gabon. Gabon, you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Le Gabon remercie le Secrétariat pour la qualité du document produit et pour le temps supplémentaire accordé à sa lecture et à sa bonne compréhension. Le Gabon souhaite apporter une modeste contribution à ce projet de note conceptuelle. Le 13e plan général de travail fait l'état des lieux de la situation sanitaire dans le monde et dresse les défis et enjeux auxquels l'OMS entend faire face dans les années à venir, notamment durant la période 2019-2023. Nous notons une grande cohérence entre la vision, les missions et la stratégie. C'est justement la stratégie que nous souhaitons revisiter avec vous. Elle comporte cinq points, dont les quatre premiers font appel aux fonctions normatives, techniques et opérationnelles de l'OMS. Le cinquième axe stratégique fait appel à sa fonction de gouvernance et sa cible n'est pas encore précisée. C'est à ce niveau que nous souhaitons contribuer. Quel pourrait être l'impact d'une plateforme de décision mondiale chez les populations pygmées de notre forêt équatoriale Nous serons bien en peine de trouver un indicateur d'impact qui permette de l'évaluer. Pour assurer des fonctions de surveillance d'alerte précoce, fournir des services de santé dans les situations d'urgence et aider les pays à parvenir à la couverture sanitaire universelle, de même qu'assurer un leadership pour les ODD liés à la santé L'OMS a besoin de systèmes de santé nationaux robustes pour mettre en œuvre ses priorités stratégiques dont nous saluons la justesse des choix. De manière concrète, nous proposons que le renforcement des systèmes de santé soit un axe stratégique à part entière et ne soit pas inclus dans l'axe stratégique de fournir des services de santé dans les situations d'urgence et renforcer les systèmes de santé. Je lis l'axe stratégique. L'OMS ne doit pas se contenter de protéger des systèmes de santé contre l'effondrement et de les reconstruire. C'est la reconnaissance là de la faiblesse de nos systèmes de santé. Combien de pays dans notre région africaine ont-ils complété, ont-ils achevé les objectifs du règlement sanitaire international Combien de pays dans notre région euh, africaine ont-ils complété les objectifs euh, non pas du développement durable, les derniers objectifs, euh, oui, des objet, pas les objectifs du développement, les OMD, les objectifs du millénaire pour le développement. Cela témoigne de la faiblesse de ces systèmes de santé qui n'arrivent pas à parachever les objectifs de santé au niveau mondial. Les indicateurs d'impact s'imposeront selon le niveau de gouvernance ciblé si l'OMS retient la consolidation des systèmes de santé. Enfin, quelques problèmes de forme dans la version française. Nous parlons de priorité aux résultats et à l'impact 
plutôt qu'aux intrants, au lieu de priorité pour les réalisations et aux produits. Ce sont juste des problèmes de terminologie. Nous avons vu aussi des déterminants commerciaux. Peut-être qu'il serait préférable de parler de déterminants économiques. Et enfin, le mot « autorité » revient à quelques reprises dans le document. Il pourrait être remplacé par des termes moins agressifs pour ne pas laisser une impression d'autoritarisme. Enfin, le Gabon soutient fortement ce projet de note conceptuelle qui vient à point nommé pour le 13e programme général de travail et assure, Monsieur le Directeur général, de la volonté des autorités en charge de la santé de notre pays que nous ne ménagerons aucun effort pour aider l'OMS à nous aider. Nous vous remercions. Thank you, Gabon, for interrogating the resilience of our health systems in terms of strengthening them. And you want it as a separate priority area uh, for the DG. And uh, you have queried the issue of the economic determinants of health. Um, I'll now I'll give Guinea. Guinea, you have the floor. Guinea. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, ours is not going to be long, but Guinea would like to uh, second South Africa's uh, reading on the, on the subject, Mr. Chairman, specifically on two points. The first one being building a resilient health system, and the second, second one being around uh, developing an army of uh, community health workers. Uh, on the first subject, on the first point, building a resilient health system, I believe we uh, all need to, to learn from the recent Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Throughout last year, uh, every time I went to uh, uh, a meeting, I, I kept saying the same thing. In Guinea, the Ebola epidemic was very severe. It was severe by uh, the geographical extent of the outbreak, as 33 out of the 38 health districts were hit by the, the epidemic. And it was also severe by the number of victims with the fatality rate uh, over 65%. Even healthcare workers were not spared uh, because 115 healthcare workers unfortunately died uh, as a result of the, the outbreak in Guinea. And I kept saying the same thing. Uh, if we, you, you look at problems from a practical point of view, frankly, when um, people go to health facilities, they would not come and ask for specialized care. Someone would never come to a health facility and say, I need to see a malaria doctor, I need to see a Nebola doctor, I need to see a TB doctor. People would come to health facilities with symptoms. People would come and uh, seek for care. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what that means, it means simply that we need to invest in building a resilient healthcare system. And that happens by strengthening human resource capacity at the service delivery plan, by developing appropriate infrastructure. If you look at those countries that were hit by the polar epidemic, specifically Guinea, what we have now, we didn't have it. It was severe, but simply because the health system was not prepared. Today, we have an infrastructure that is able to separate suspicious cases from probable cases, from confirmed cases, which we didn't have before. The laboratory capacity was not there. The first samples that were taken had to be shipped out of the country in order to confirm the diagnosis. And um, definitely we would address this issue by building a strong and resilient health system that would knock down the verticalized approach that has been the practice up until today. And Mr. Chairman, on the second point, uh, building an army of community health workers, the UNAIDS took the opportunity of uh, the, the recent meeting in Guinea, the AWA meeting, the Africa AIDS Watch Technical Working Group uh, meeting to launch actually this initiative and uh, in the recent AU assembly, head of state's assembly on July 3rd, I believe it was in Addis Ababa, pres the president of Guinea, who happens to be the chairperson for the, the, the chair president for uh, the African Union, endorsed it. I don't know if um, everyone has seen the document, but on the first page, 
it says community health workers are the lifeline of Africa and uh, that sentence is actually uh, from President Alpha Conde. He, uh, he actually uh, presented the idea to uh, the member state head of states and um, endorsed it and I think the idea is gaining a lot of traction and we believe that it is the way forward. We believe that it is the way to solve our problem basically by de developing a whole army of healthcare workers that would deliver a very specific uh, healthcare package at the community level and that would help us prevent uh, this, the unfortunate situation that we had uh, like the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Thank you. I'd like to thank you, Honorable Minister, and I know every international forum that I've met you, you have been very passionate about uh, strengthen, strengthening health systems. And I think it's coming out very strongly that uh, we need resilient health systems. And the issue of community health workers keeps on coming up very strongly too. So I think, I hope it will be incorporated in a more sanctified way in our document. Now, uh, Liberia, Liberia, now I have the floor. Thank you so much, Honorable Chair. And um, <clears throat> again, it's quite interesting that, I, that the Minister of Gaming uh, and I were thinking in the same direction because um, every time we go to meetings, we talk about resilient, say, in the healthcare system. And I think this is something that is very critical. But have we, as healthcare, work, as healthcare provider, are we that have been called to serve our people to make sure that their health is sustainable? Have we taught or internalized what do we mean by resiliency in the healthcare system? Have we thought about it? Or is just mere uh, new world or new terminology that we all are clutching to and not understanding its implication on what it means within the healthcare system? So let me tell you what I think and wish to propose that we all need to think about. So for me, Resiliency in the healthcare system, based on the experiences we've had in Liberia, especially during the time of Ebola, practically based on the perception of those that we are serving, that is the community. If those people were to come to the health facility and realize that the supply chain management is broken, there is no medication, there is nothing, when you tell them about resiliency, would they understand it? No. For them, if they were ill and they went to the hospital, they should be able to get their medication and so forth. So we have to look at resiliency as a means of, yes, the system can be tested, but it can never be broken. It can be bent, but never broken. To do that, we have to look at it from a triangular perspective. And from the triangular perspective, I think the fulcrum of resiliency that we all yearn for should be the perception of the community. That is, the community has to be the central focus of this resiliency. On the other hand, that is the lower right of this triangle that I'm trying to think about in my head, it should be the structure. On that structure, what are some of the things that are critical? We talk about, and uh, the Honorable Minister from South Africa talk about uh, procurement and supply chain management. This is something that we have filled completely in many cases. So we have to make sure that we strengthen the supply, the procurement and supply chain management at the structural level. We also have to look at maintenance of our equipment at, this, at that structural level. And if we can do that, then of course we have to look at the healthcare workforce. On the healthcare workforce, we talk about fit for purpose, we talk about motivated healthcare workers. How many times have we looked at our health workers and show that they are excited? Because if they are not excited, it doesn't matter what system you have, what structure you put in place, at that structural level, the outcome will be poor. Someone who is not happy cannot produce a good result. And so we have to begin to focus on them. As we build their capacity, we need to motivate them. We need to make sure that whatever structure we are putting in place, they have the capability of making sure that they can maximize the use of that. And then at the apex, that is the system that we run. So our system should be in place where we can track those processes from the structure, from the healthcare workforce, in order to make sure that we have continuous supply, our people are happy, and when the community, when our people go to the services,
they can receive a good a good service if this is done definitely we are getting to the kind of resiliency that i think we are thinking about and then again uh my my brother again from from guinea talk about the the army of healthcare workers yes in liberia our minister began immediately where the president of liberia challenged the ministry to produce community health workers so now we are uh, producing community health care workers that have the capability not only looking at uh, uh, surveillance and so forth, but at the same time making sure that NCDs, HIV, and other things, their core capacity is being built in order to make sure that they are the army that will detect some of the NCDs and other things that we need to take care of, and then they can uh, inform those people to come to the health care system. And so, if these people come to the healthcare system and the system is not strong enough to provide the care, it becomes a problem. So we have to work together in order to do this. I think if we can incorporate this in, um, in the program of work, I think as an African country or the continent of Africa, we will be in a better position to strengthen and build the resiliency in the healthcare system. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Liberia. I think the issue here is, have we internalized what we are talking about? And you know, West Africa, in terms of Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone, most of us, yes, have experienced disruption in our health systems. But the Ebola, the Ebola epidemic in that area really devastated uh, the region. And they are talking with a lot of passion because of that experience. And they strengthen, again, community health workers. They talk about human resources and supply chain. So it's all coming around health system strengthening. Um, Ghana, Ghana, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, I want to congratulate the Director General and the Secretariat, the um, African group for this strategic um, plan that you call program of work. I want to believe that almost everything that should be covered has been covered. Very long, insightful um, analysis by South Africa. It looks like almost everything is here. All the contributions I've been listening to are all here. What I believe we should do is to look at the implementation strategy and put in a few more things. All the strategies we're talking about, all the activities and programs, are supposed to be funded. And I believe that is where our challenges arise. Strengthening health systems, resilience, emergency responses, I mean, motivation of workforce, getting community health work, I mean, workers, we will use investments to arrive at all these things. The problem I believe we have, not peculiar to Ghana, my situation might be different, but not too different from others. How are we implementing the Abuja Declaration? Ensuring that countries devote as much as 15% budgetary allocations or GDP to health systems. Are we complying ourselves to this? And the fact I want to come forward with is that during budgetary allocations, you can't get any finance, sorry, health minister who will get what he wants from the national budgets. More often, the finance ministers, together with the economic management teams, they decide and do their optimum allocations, and what they will allocate to the health system is what we manage with. My question is who? sits somewhere between the, the health ministers, the finance ministers, and our presidents to ensure that we get allocations that are a bit adequate to enable us to achieve all these things that we are talking about. So I believe it is time WHO adopts a new strategy. Probably pick yourself as a lobbyist for resource allocations on the continent to be skewed towards health in a way. So relationships with our presidents and relationships with our finance ministers, I believe 
will do a lot to help us take this sense. Honestly, when we come here, we meet not as politicians as we are, but we come as professionals. So if you listen to the contributions, everybody is trying to put up the best that he knows from his profession. But when we get back home, that is where politics comes. The great minister wants a chunk. The education minister wants a chunk. The health minister wants what he thinks he should get. But a decision as to who gets what doesn't come from us. You might have a very strong health minister who will be able to get the prime minister or the president allocate what he wants. But I believe quite a large number of us can be weak. I wouldn't say we are weak when it comes to resource allocation and fighting for what can help us achieve the plans and strategies we will have for different individual countries. So I think WHO should begin to look at what new things that they can do. Probably trying to engage the international finance corporate, I mean, institutions through whatever they can do in allocating and lending and granting a lot more to help sector specific so that we can have adequate resources to do what we are supposed to do. Other than that, I'm afraid we can't get anywhere. Then I'll suggest that WHO and your country um, directors find a way to be monitoring just allocation envelopes and be reporting. And then WHO at the highest level engage with their presidents to prompt them that if you did this declaration at Abuja, Mr. President, your country is not working towards that. That cannot come from us. Definitely none of us will be so bold to go to our president to tell him this. But I believe the top guy at WHO, the African group, engaging some of our presidents can do some of these things for us. So we need to begin to build bridges and get lobbying from the top level to our presidents. And I think when we're able to do that sufficiently, some of these things will work. Jeffrey Sachs is looking for money from World Bank towards this two million uh, um, community worker issue. Who is supporting him? Do we have WHO, the group of African, I mean, health ministers, or who, specifically in health, is supporting that is fight within the World Bank and, um, I mean, IMF enclave? That is where I think we should begin to look at, and when we're able to garnish adequate resources, that will be okay. The other thing is that we ourselves, as Africans, should begin to identify certain things that we should do in common. We are thinking of African Medicine Center. We are thinking of um, African CDC. And I think that is the way we should go. Can we pull resources, contributions from individual countries to strengthen some of these areas that can have common benefit for all of us? Our research centers, I don't expect every country in Africa to have research centers like what we have in Ghana, Noguchi, or what we may probably have in Nigeria or South Africa. So if through WHO we pick or like the AMA we are trying to do, like the African um, CDC, probably research centers closer to where we think that we need a little bit more resilience, a little bit more research findings to implement, will also help. So these are strategies that you can craft for adoption at AU so that we can pull together and build, build stronger institutions that will help making our systems work better. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Honorable Minister from Ghana. And to your right, South Africa has articulated a lot of the issues. But uh, um, the implementation strategy is key here, and the issue of funding. And now WHO is being given a new, I think, a new revised role of being lobbyists between us and the Ministers of Finance. I hope you get a response. And then, of course, the issue of pooling resources as African countries uh, so that we can uh, get on together. Um, Mali, Mali, you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Mesdames et Messieurs les Ministres, Monsieur le Directeur Général de l'OMS, Madame la Directrice Régionale, chers participants, j'ai l'honneur de prendre la parole au nom du Mali pour le féliciter le secrétariat pour la clarté des documents qui nous, est, qui nous, sont, qui nous est soumis. Et aussi remercier le président de cette session pour le temps supplémentaire qu'il nous a accordé 
pour examiner le document. Ça voudrait dire que, au nom du Mali, nous approuvons la note de synthèse sur le 13e programme 2019-2023. Mais permettez-moi, Monsieur le Président, de faire une suggestion et aussi de partager une information. Tous en relation avec les stratégies contenues dans ce document. Dans les stratégies, au deuxième point, nous voyons fournir des services de santé dans des situations d'urgence et renforcer les systèmes de santé. Pour nous, il fallait mettre d'abord en première option le renforcement du système de santé. Monsieur le Président, après l'épisode malheureux de la maladie à virus Ebola que le Mali a connu, cette épidémie a prouvé à suffisance la fragilité de nos systèmes de santé, pas seulement au Mali, mais surtout aussi dans des pays d'Afrique de l'Ouest et d'autres pays qui ont connu cette épidémie. En son temps, nous avons sorti les armes qui étaient à notre possession. Chez nous, au Mali, nous avons mis en place ce qu'on avait appelé le centre d'opération d'urgence, qui était sous la supervision directe du président de la République et aussi piloté par l'actuel ministre de la Santé, le professeur Samba Ousmane Sou. Vous avez tous célébré avec nous les résultats que nous avons engagés. Je voudrais dire quoi C'est que nous devons progressivement sortir des situations d'urgence. Je parle spécifiquement de mon cas parce que nous sommes dans une situation difficile aujourd'hui, notamment à cause de la, de la crise sécuritaire que connaît notre, la partie septentrionale de notre pays. Ça veut dire que nous souhaitons que dorénavant, que l'on mette l'accent sur le renforcement des systèmes de santé et, et si besoin en était, apporter des solutions d'urgence. C'était la suggestion que nous voulons faire à ce niveau. Et l'information que nous voulons partager, lorsque nous lisons toujours dans les stratégies, à savoir la mise en place de la couverture sanitaire universelle, c'est des problèmes de terminologie, de concepts, mais je voudrais surtout partager l'information que le Mali s'emploie à mettre en place la couverture maladie universelle de, déjà en janvier 2018. Monsieur le Président, voilà ce que je voulais dire à ce, à ce stade. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Mali. Um, honorable delegate from Mali. I hope you got your luggage. You, you don't seem to have changed your clothes yet. I, I, did you get your luggage? I hope you got your non. luggage. Uh, the health system non, Monsieur le Président, vous me voyez. Uh, Depuis le premier jour, je suis avec uh, uh, le même blazer. <laughs> yes. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, we will follow it up. Um, health system strengthening is coming up again very strongly and universal health coverage. Um, Benin, Benin, you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Comme le Bénin a dit hier, nous nous retrouvons dans la vision, la mission et les stratégies définies par ce document, puisqu'en réalité, c'est un document général qui définit un cadre général dans lequel les pays vont s'inspirer pour euh, élaborer euh, leurs priorités. Et donc, nous nous retrouvons dans ça. En réalité, tout est dedans. Le problème, c'est comment opérationnaliser tout ça qui est le plus important. Sinon, tout a été dit. Et je voudrais euh, insister essentiellement sur la question des ressources humaines. Si nous voulons des systèmes de santé solides, capables de faire face aux défis actuels, nous devons régler la question des ressources humaines à tous les niveaux de la pyramide sanitaire. Les prédécesseurs ont parlé du dispositif communautaire qui doit être renforcé, mais je voudrais aussi mettre l'accent sur la formation des ressources humaines qualifiées. Puisqu'aujourd'hui, dans nos différents pays, nous avons un déficit criard. Comment l'OMS peut revenir, comme il faisait par le passé, appuyer les pays dans la formation des ressources humaines de qualité Notamment en mobilisant, en aidant les États à mobiliser le financement aussi par rapport à ça. L'OMS aussi a une expérience de développer des centres de formation d'excellence, des pôles régionaux de formation. Est-ce qu'aujourd'hui, on ne va pas revoir ces aspects pour mutualiser les énergies, pour mutualiser nos ressources, parce que nous disons que les ressources sont limitées, mais il faut les mutualiser pour avoir plus d'impact. Deuxième chose, nous sommes face au défi des maladies non transmissibles. Il est vrai que nous devons développer des stratégies 
pour la prévention, pour les activités promotionnelles, mais nous devons aussi faire face à la prise en charge des malades. Et aujourd'hui, dans nos pays, le système, le système hospitalier ne permet pas toujours de prendre en charge ces cas. Et on a souligné ici hier qu'il y a beaucoup d'évacuations de, sanitaires en dehors de l'espace de la région africaine, par exemple. Est-ce qu'on ne peut pas aussi mutualiser nos énergies pour avoir des pôles d'excellence au niveau de la région pour que les évacuations, la prise en charge, à défaut que tout soit fait au niveau national, ça soit fait au niveau de la région. Voilà les éléments essentiels sur lesquels le Bénin voudrait euh, insister et dire que le cadre général du document nous permet d'avoir les éléments nécessaires pour travailler. Et c'est ça le plus important. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Um, thanks, Benin, for emphasizing again the issue of implementation. Uh, we are doing well. We still have uh, about 11 agenda items to go through, but we are doing very well here. And I want to thank honorable ministers and delegates uh, for the very, very pertinent and useful contributions that, that, that they've made. I will now call upon uh, Dr. Okwe Bele to respond to some of these issues. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. We took ex uh, very careful notes of um, the very good inputs that uh, we have received since uh, yesterday, actually. And Mr. Chair, your summing up of um, each one of the interventions actually gives us a great record of the key points uh, that have been highlighted. And uh, I would like personally to thank you for for that, because it will help us as we compile all the excellent inputs we received um, in uh, working towards uh, a, a draft general program of work. I think we heard even um, contributions with regard to the language we have to use, uh, for instance, in the French version. Um, on the structure, what we heard is that um, in most uh, Most of those who uh, made contributions indicate that um, they feel um, there is great coherence in what is being proposed, especially between the vision and the mission and the high level uh, priorities. And um, I think we heard clearly that, for instance, um, the mission um, uh, has never been so clearly expressed. Um, so thank you for this uh, feedback. We did hear also that uh, there is need to look at a uh, way we could uh, provide indication on the linkages uh, between what is being suggested here with some other key initiatives that are ongoing. And um, we know that uh, the DG has instructed that uh, we have to keep working so that we build on what is happening already. Um, the issues of um, the balance between USC, universal health coverage, and uh, working in health emergencies, uh, preventing epidemics, that balance um, has to be taken care of. And, and we heard the uh, strong call for ensuring that um, you know, we facilitate um, uh, the capacity that will help us to have um, resilient health systems. Um, we heard um, also some of the uh, calls with regard to some of the operating principle on the um, political commitment and, and ensuring that um, we have um, the support of um, those who can help to allocate resources. Um, we heard that you are willing to support uh, the organization of a special session in November. Uh, so that more can be uh, said at that time prior to us uh, reviewing the draft document at the, the, the executive board in January. Um, there was also a suggestion that um, this is this being worked out uh, with a Geneva-based uh, mission. So I will rather stop here in terms of uh, indicating what we at the Secretary have, uh, will have heard and will, will take uh, forward. And again, uh, thank you, you very, very much for the excellent inputs. But I'm very sure that um, DG 
uh, may want to reflect on some of the excellent points uh, that have been made. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Okwabele. Um, regional Director? No? It's too big. Could you? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Chair. I will just uh, briefly um, reflect on some of the issues from the regional perspective and from some of the experiences in the region. Indeed, many of the comments made were simply re-emphasizing certain components of this GPW framework and highlighting how important they are for the, for the region. I just wanted to say, as, as regards two things, one, climate change. I, I do recall that about six years ago in the, re, in the region, we developed a framework for developing mitigation plans. We did recognize then that the health sector was somewhat marginalized in those processes around climate change. And this was the time when there had been the announcement of financing for climate change mitigation in countries and we were hopeful that countries would be able to capture some of this money for health. We developed some tools, we helped countries to develop plans. So I think we need to re-emphasize this. I agree with the suggestion to emphasize this in the, in, the, in the document, but we do need to learn why this didn't help us, why this did not work. As a secretariat, we developed tools, processes, but we still find the health sector does not get centrally involved in those uh, discussions, including hopefully in, in, in mobilizing some of funding that might become available now. I also want to, to support strongly the, the, the matter of community health workers, but also indicate that in the framework of how to make better use of existing human resources, we do need to emphasize also the issue of what we call task shifting, because we've, we've observed that it happens to different degrees in the region. I agree with the comment that we, we need to work on community health workers, increase the number of professional health workers, and utilize better the existing, especially non-medical healthcare workers for primary health care in the region. So these are some of the strategic issues that need to be emphasized because we notice that this happens to very different degrees in different parts of the, of the continent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Regional Director. Director General. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. First of all, I would like to thank you for all the recommendations, uh, comments you have given us. Uh, I know this will uh, enrich uh, the document. Uh, as we have said yesterday and today, uh, this is the start of the consultation. Still, we're uh, developing the uh, document, uh, so your comments will help us in, in reaching it. So feel free also going forward to send us any comments you have via email or other means. So we're still open to uh, accommodate and revise because this GPW belongs to you. Uh, it's You are the uh, owners and you should shape it the way uh, you want. And the input we got today is uh, really uh, excellent. Uh, maybe to just comment on uh, some of the issues uh, you raised. One on the uh, UHC. Uh, I think while uh, working on the GPW, um, we were discussing during lunch time also with Aaron, uh, we have to continue to advocate for UHC. I think promoting it wherever uh, we are is going to be very important. We don't need even to wait until this thing is completed. And UHC, we have agreed now, I'm really glad that it's the center of gravity. This is not a new thing, we have been saying it, uh, but we need to really do it with more vigor now, and we need to be more and more uh, aggressive, uh, because that's the center of uh, gravity. If UHC could be a consensus, including by our leaders, then that addresses the problems we see uh, or the challenges we're facing with regard to communicable diseases, the challenges we're facing with non-communicable diseases. So UHC means, based on countries' needs and situation and priorities, to have the best quality service uh, to address the challenges. And then uh, with UHC, as you know, uh, we have to put uh, primary health care at the center. 
uh, I'm really glad you raised the army of community health workers you mentioned. I think uh, focusing strongly on prevention, health promotion and prevention will be really, really important and you have already uh, stressed that. So from the UHC, the primary health care part to focus on, on health promotion and prevention is important. Both for communicable diseases and non-communicable diseases, uh, health promotion and disease prevention uh, will be uh, central. Uh, Aaron was saying it uh, proper, uh, uh, nicely yesterday and today also uh, repeated uh, and other uh, ministers also. Non-communicable diseases are starting to be a problem in Africa. Um, less of a problem compared to other regions, but if you see the trend, it's increasing also really quickly. So focus on prevention and health promotion using, based on the risk factors, the known four risk factors uh, will be very, very important. And the risk factors are related, as you rightly said, uh, to uh, commercial determinants or economic determinants. I think the language we can, we can agree. And that when you spoke yesterday and today, related to industries also. Uh, so uh, investment on health promotion and this prevention especially in the fight against non-communicable diseases uh, will, will, be, will be very important. Uh, then the uh, other issue you stressed on is the human resources. Uh, I hear you very well. We may not be able to build excellent medical schools in each and every country, but I really agree with what uh, one of our colleagues said uh, uh, from Benin having centers of excellence will be important for, for, for a regional centers of excellence. And I think we can build those uh, together, but the human resources should be a priority. And we have to uh, make it a standing priority that we always discuss uh, about, because without human resources, the whole health system doesn't work. I mean, the central uh, part or the important asset of our health system is the human resources. So we have to invest uh, on that and uh, uh, all of you stressed on that and I think uh, it's, it's important and we will take it seriously too. Then the rest is the infrastructure you said and having heard to all you said, I think focus on all building blocks of the health system will be important be it the infrastructure or human resources, service delivery, information system, access to medicine and governance. I think focus on all building blocks of the health system, using those as, as indicators or check and balance to see whether we have a resilient or strong health system will be uh, important. So when we see, the, when we check the strengths, the strengths of the health system, it's good to take into account all the building blocks of uh, the health system. Finally, the domestic uh, resource mobilization and uh, financing uh, in general. Uh, I am really happy that you um, said this should be done uh, politically and that we have to work very closely with uh, finance ministers, heads of states, from my brother, uh, Minister of Ghana, and heads of states and the government is, is going to be very, very important. Uh, the last 50 days since I took office, I had the opportunity uh, to meet uh, leaders, and you can see their readiness and, and commitment. If, if we can um, lobby, as he had been said, or advocate. As you remember, in the G20 summit, universal health coverage was underlined and emergency response, same way, antimicrobial resistance, and also strengthening and supporting uh, WHO. Uh, we, we, we can start uh, from there, and there are many committed, uh, politically committed leaders in our continent that we can work with, and to make this an important agenda, especially UHC at the African Union level, so that our leaders can also influence each other 
the peer pressure is 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 very uh, very uh, important so not only engaging heads of states heads of government or finance ministers in each country but using their platforms like the african union the our continental political organization uh, will help in pushing the agenda forward especially in domestic resource mobilization one thing i would like to uh, share with you with regard to domestic resource mobilization is there was an initiative that was uh, started by the former AU chair, um, Chad, uh, president, and the president of uh, uh, Rwanda, uh, Paul Kagame, to cover 100% of the regular budget of the African Union, 75% of program budget, and 25% of budget for peace and security. This was done because the leaders really were, were tired of asking for funding whenever a funding is needed for programs or regular budget from, from donors. And they underlined that if we have commitment, we have resources that we can use. We may not graduate fully, that's why the program budget is 75%, but the bulk of the funding could come from our own uh, coffers. So for the health sector, the same thing can be done. If there is commitment, I think the resources could be tapped. And when we talk about resources, I think it's very important that we start from using our own resources and using other resources as a, comp as a supplement, as, a, as just a supplement to cover a small part of uh, what uh, we need. Uh, otherwise, uh, the big portion of the resource should come from uh, our own sources and as you have rightly suggested engaging the heads of states advocating at that level engaging the heads of government and finance ministers will be very important but we need to prepare well and we have to uh, lobby when we lobby using the language that they uh, can understand and in a way that makes sense uh, to them. But when you do it that way, I have seen actually uh, change in uh, uh, you know, the mindset and also uh, preparedness uh, to, to, to help. So the resources, I think, are important, especially uh, domestic resources. Uh, but we will do our best also to mobilize new funding we're strengthening our resource mobilization unit that, as I said in my speech at the opening, one of the initiatives uh, we started to, uh, for, to really t move fast is the resource mobilization part. Uh, so we will uh, continue to strengthen it and tap the resources that uh, we can get. And one good opportunity is the World Bank's uh, continued engagement and renewed commitment uh, to avail more funding, uh, and that is uh, a good news. I had a meeting with the President last week in uh, Geneva. Uh, we, we can go for different combinations of uh, resources, uh, but finding, as you rightly said, new funding will be important, especially the human resource part, which you have already underlined. So t t with that, I thank you so much again for all your uh, inputs and looking forward uh, with you uh, very closely. And please send us any uh, comments uh, you have. It could be via email or uh, other uh, means. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Okwebele. Thank you, Dr. Moeti and Dr. Tadros. Now, shall we take it that the Secretariat has taken into consideration the feedback received from this meeting, which will be used to guide the development of the 13th uh, GPW? Yes, I see. Yes, I see everybody saying yes. Um, well, this brings the end uh, to, uh, to this session. We will now, we've got another about just under 40.
45 minutes to look at agenda item number seven on the international health regulations 2005 and to review of the draft five-year global strategic plan to improve public health preparedness and response document AFR stroke RC 67 stroke 4. I am informed by the Secretariat this, that this agenda item is tabled before us following the recommendations of this year's Health Assembly for the regional committees to review the guiding principles and pillars of the five-year global strategic plan and to provide their views on the IHR monitoring and evaluation framework. I will now give the floor to Dr. Zabuloni Yoti, representing the Director for WHO Health Emergencies Program to introduce this document. Dr. Yoti, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Ministers, distinguished delegates, on behalf of the Secretariat, I have this privilege to introduce the document AFR stroke RSC 67 stroke 4, which is entitled International Health Regulations, Review of the Draft Five-Year Global Strategy Plan to improve public health preparedness and response. As a consultative process, uh, this same document will be presented in the other regional committees uh, between now and November to get inputs from all the regions. Uh, Mr. Chair, you will recall that the development of this five-year global strategic plan was a recommendation of the post Ebola International Health Regulations Review Committee. And this committee went into details to analyze what happened during Ebola uh, uh, epidemic and documented the lessons learned for uh, improving on the implementation of international health regulations. As you have said, this recommendation has been supported by the World Health Assembly through decision WHA 70 stroke 11 which is to develop in full consultation with the member states, including through the regional committees, a draft five-year global strategic plan to improve public health preparedness and response. And based on a clear guiding principles, very clear guiding principles, uh, and to be submitted for consideration and adoption of the 71st World Health Assembly through the executive board at its one for the se second session, which will be early next year. Just briefly, this document highlights some of the key issues raised during the 70th, 70th WHA, in particular with regards to the IHR monitoring and evaluation framework, including the voluntary joint external evaluations, simulation exercises, and after action review. Some member states have uh, uh, requested that this new approach, although voluntary, should be submitted and adopted by the governing bodies. To conclude, with this, the Secretariat is therefore inviting comments on three key areas proposed for development of the five-year uh, global strategic plan. Namely, one, the process of consultation which is through the regional committees now, and then through web-based uh, consultation, and uh, through Geneva-based missions, where there will be presentations made, and then, which, uh, uh, of course, a draft developed, and then submitted to the executive board. Number two, comments on the 12 guiding principles which have been included. And among these includes, of course, country ownership, broad partnerships and community involvement. Let me highlight these three. And then lastly, you are requested to provide comments on the three pillars which have been proposed. First one, building and maintaining state parties' core capacities required by the IHR. Secondly, event management and compliance. And then lastly, measuring progress and accountability. With this, I therefore request uh, that 
we take notes from you as you give inputs to these areas. Thank you. Um, thank you, Yoti, for that very brief but uh, concise uh, presentation. Uh, distinguished guests, distinguished uh, delegates, uh, ministers, um, we now open the floor for discussion, for comments on the document on international health regulations. I notice Zambia, United Republic of Tanzania, Malawi, Burundi, Eritrea, Kenya, Comoros, Ghana, Uganda, Senegal, South Africa, Namibia, We've got, like I say, just under 45 minutes to discuss this very important issue. Hmm? Benin. Benin. Thank you. We'll start with uh, Zambia. Zambia, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Chairperson, for the opportunity. May I, also, may I take this opportunity, first of all, to thank the uh, Secretariat um, under the leadership of the Regional Director for having worked very hard in preparing this document. Chairperson, before I present um, our comments on the uh, proposed process and focus areas, I wish to share with you what uh, the government of Zambia, through the Ministry of Health, has been able to implement with regard to improving public health preparedness and response in the country. We have established the National Public Health Institute, the function of which is to provide a defined coordination mechanism that will turn the many challenges currently faced into opportunities for a successful public health surveillance. The National Public Health Institute is a, will be a specialized institution whose main mandate is to support districts in improving health of the people through prevention, surveillance, and response to emergencies, including outbreaks, man-made and natural disasters, and public health events and capacity building in reducing the disease burden in the country. Among other things, the focus will be to build capacities in the country to detect and respond quickly and effectively to disease threats and outbreaks based on science, policy, and data-driven interventions. Zambia uh, chairperson has also been designated as uh, the Southern African Development Community Regional Collaboration Center to coordinate the southern region of Africa under the Center for Disease Control established by the heads of state and government during the 24th um, Ordinary General Assembly in Addis Ababa in January of 2015. The Regional Collaborating um, Center, um, the main function will be to provide technical support to member states in the southern uh, region to ensure that the core capacities in surveillance laboratory systems and networks, information systems, emergency preparedness and response in public health research are implemented and strengthened. Allow me, Chairperson, to comment on the five-year global strategy. Again, to thank the Secretariat uh, in um, implementing the International Regulation Monitoring and Evaluation uh, Framework. And we are happy with the technical guidance provided by the Secretariat 
we underscore chairperson the fact that the implementation of the regulations should be driven by evidence. Zambia agrees uh, that the joint external evaluation and the international health regulation monitoring and evaluation framework are essential for fostering the implementation of the international regulation of 2005. However, we wish to request that the external evaluation should not become a precondition for receiving financial and technical assistance. A chairperson, I would like to end by stating that we acknowledge and support the proposed way forward for the consultative process for the development of the draft five-year global strategy. I thank you. Uh, thank you, Zambia. Can I just say in, in, a, in a very polite way that, very polite, extremely polite way, that when, when we give our, our presentations, let's limit them to, to three minutes and try to incorporate your country experiences, if you have to, in, in that three minutes. Um, so in a very polite way, please, uh, colleagues, um, but thank you, Zambia, for highlighting the issue of that it should be evidence-based and also that uh, external evaluation should really not be the, the basis for, 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 for funding. So those are very two important points. Um, United Republic of Tanzania. Thank you very much, Chair. United Republic of Tanzania welcomes the guiding principles and pillars of the five-year global strategic plan to improve public health preparedness and response prepared by the Secretariat. We note that among the guiding principles is having country ownership, being the first country to, ve to develop a plan following joint external evaluation, we can attest to this. The success in development of our national plan relied very much on country driving the process and owning it while at the same time ensuring a whole of society approach with a broader health system vision. Chairperson, this coming September 2017, Tanzania will launch its National Health Security Plan 2017-2023 in the Parliament so as to solicit domestic funding for implementation of the plan. This is a pathway we envision that will increase ownership of the plan by the country. We are ready to share our lessons learned with other countries. Chairperson, we noted in the information note for member states, document misses other key important elements to consider. We would like to propose an additional pillar, improve rapid sharing of public health and scientific information and data, and this was among the 11, health, 11 recommendations by Joint External Evaluation Review Committee of International Health Regulations. We would like in the guiding principles an emphasis of linkage with other WHO global initiatives like, for example, pandemic influenza preparedness and antimicrobial resistance initiative, which also aim to at building certain international health regulations country capacities. Chairperson, we look forward to participate further in reviewing this document through the web-based consultations as well as the planned November face-to-face -face consultations of member states through our Geneva-based mission focal point. I thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, United Republic of Tanzania, for emphasizing the importance of linkages and to rapidly share information uh, with, with various players. Um, Malawi, Malawi, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair, for giving Malawi the floor. Malawi totally agrees with the idea of uh, developing a five-year global strategic plan to improve uh, public health uh, preparedness and response. As a country, we've developed uh, core capacities as required by the international health regulations. There are trained health workers at all our ports of, ports of entry, and the focal person has been appointed uh, in the ministry. However, as a country, we need uh, both technical 
and financial support to assess, build, and maintain our core capacities as uh, required by the regulations for us to improve on the public health uh, preparedness and response. We fully support uh, the proposed way forward. And uh, my initial comment was that we, we support the three pillars, but I note that in Tanzania's comment, they want us to add uh, a fourth pillar, which is uh, 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 the rapid sharing of results. But I note that that comes actually under event management and uh, compliance. So I'm not sure how we can fit it in there. But otherwise, uh, congratulations to the team, and we support the, uh, the development of this five-year global strategy plan. Thank you. Thank you, Malawi, for emphasizing on, on sharing. Burundi, Burundi, you have the floor. Merci de me passer la parole. Le Burundi remercie le secrétariat pour le document qu'il a mis à notre disposition. Soucieux de la prévention de la propagation des maladies à travers le monde en général et la promotion de la bonne santé de sa population en particulier, Le gouvernement de la République du Burundi s'est associé aux autres nations du monde en ratifiant les conventions internationales et les autres textes légaux, dont le règlement sanitaire international qui avait été adopté le 23 mai 2005 par la 58e Assemblée mondiale de la santé et entré en vigueur le 15 juin 2007. En date du 29 juin 2007, notre gouvernement a lancé officiellement la mise en œuvre du règlement sanitaire international. Pour marquer le début de la mise en œuvre du règlement sanitaire international, le ministère de la Santé publique et de la lutte contre le sida a désigné un point focal national chargé en permanence de faciliter la collaboration multisectorielle et le contact avec l'OMS. Un comité national de suivi d'IRSI et un comité technique de mise en œuvre ont été par la suite nommés. Dans le cadre du processus de mise en œuvre d'IRSI, un atelier d'évaluation des capacités nationales fut organisé en février 2009. Au cours de cet atelier, les points d'entrée ont été désignés et une évaluation des capacités fonctionnelles existantes à ce niveau fut effectuée. Au mois de juin 2009, un atelier de validation du plan d'action RSI a eu lieu à Bujumbola et son plan fut approuvé et validé. En date du 19 septembre 2011, notre pays a participé à un atelier interpays à Libreville pour l'adaptation du guide technique de la surveillance intégrée de la maladie et riposte et l'accélération de la mise en œuvre de RSI. Le Burundi actuellement mène des activités de surveillance contre les maladies à potentiel épidémique et les événements de santé publique à portée internationale. Ces pathologies sous surveillance sont la maladie à virus Ebola, choléra, paludisme, méningite, rougeole, paralysie, flasque aiguë, dysenterie, bacillus et tétanos néonatal. Un plan de contingence a été élaboré pour faire face aux épidémies de choléra. Les capacités ont été renforcées au niveau de certains points d'entrée, notamment à l'aéroport international de Bujumbura, et des rapports de mise en œuvre de RSI ont été transmis régulièrement à l'OMS Genève. Le pays continue à faire des efforts pour la mise en œuvre effective de RSI et demande un accompagnement technique et financier. La délégation burundaise demande à l'OMS de faire le suivi de la mise en œuvre de RSI au niveau de chaque pays membre et d'apporter un appui financier et technique. Enfin, la délégation burundaise soutient le projet proposé et demande à l'Assemblée ici présente de l'adopter. Je vous remercie. Uh, thank you, Burundi, for supporting the document. Eritrea, Eritrea, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> Eritrea welcomes the draft five-year global strategic plan to improve public health preparedness and response as it will enhance effective implementation of the international health regulation in all member states. We believe that the guiding principles and pillars elaborated in the draft global strategic plan will be useful in guiding the implementation of the national action plans at country level. Mr.
architecture. Like all member states of our region, Eritrea was not able to meet the minimum requirements in the first five years after the International Health Regulation entered into force. In 2016, Eritrea conducted self-assessment using the WHO-based standard assessment tool. This was followed by a joint external evaluation whereby multi-sectoral team experts participated in a week-long assessment. In the joint external evaluation, all the 19 action technical areas were assessed and the findings demonstrated that there were gaps in key core technical areas. Based on the findings of the joint external evaluation, a costed national action plan was developed in April 2017 which defined the implementation mechanism. But implementation of the national action plan will not be easy as it will demand strong leadership at national level huge investment both from domestic resource and international partners to address the gaps identified in the JEE. Besides, technical guidance and assistance from WHO and other UN agencies will be very crucial in the implementation process. Finally, recognizing the importance of the draft five-year global strategic plan to improve public health preparedness and response in the implementation of the International Health Regulation, the Eritrean delegation would like to express its support for the draft document and is pleased to participate in, in further consultations for its final development. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eritrea, for that support to the document. Uh, Kenya, Kenya, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Allow me to thank the Secretariat for facilitating this consultation with member states on the development of a draft five year global strategic plan to improve the public health preparedness and response. Kenya remain committed uh, to the implementation of IHR 2000 uh, and 7 to increase the national capacities to prevent, uh, detect, and respond to public health threats. Uh, Mr. Chairperson, uh, we note that uh, many of the African countries, of course Kenya included, are yet to fully attain the IHR core capacities. Kenya volunteered for and participated um, uh, successfully in the joint external evaluation uh, six months ago this year. At present, Kenya is in the process of developing an IHR coordination platform to monitor the IHR implementation in the country in addition to developing an implementation plan of action which will facilitate uh, mobilization of finances, technical support towards this implementation. Uh, Mr. Chairperson, with regard to the proposed strategic plan, uh, Kenya is in full support of the proposal to develop an IHR monitoring and evaluation framework, uh, which Mr. Chairman uh, should uh, be country-owned, should be participatory, and driven uh, by the available uh, evidence. We therefore call upon WHO to encourage uh, more countries to participate in the JE to be able to identify their gaps uh, in their capacities and they have to develop the implementation plans to strengthen their preparedness and response uh, to public health uh, uh, events. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, we take note a multi-sectoral coordination coupled with surveillance and response to chemical, radiological, nuclear events still pose a significant challenge in implementation of IHR. Kenya is therefore keen to participate in the piloting of the tools being developed by Secretariat and looks forward to implementing the global strategy plan uh, to improve the public health preparedness and response. I thank you. Thank you, Kenya, for highlighting the need to to be more emphatic on the chemical, biological, and radiological uh, challenges that are posed through the international um, uh, health regulations. I think we, we need to look at that. We need to look at that. Comoros, Comoros, uh, you have the floor. Excellence, Mesdames et Messieurs les Ministres, Monsieur le Directeur Général de l'OMS, Madame la directrice régionale, distinguée chef des délégations en vos rangs et qualité, permettez-moi tout d'abord, honorable assistance, 
au nom du gouvernement de l'Union des Comores, de présenter les sincères félicitations au Dr Tedros pour son élection au poste du DG, du directeur général de l'OMS. Nous lui souhaitons une bonne santé, réussite et brillante carrière durant son mandat. Nous félicitons le secrétariat pour la mise à la disposition du présent plan stratégique mondial quinquennal pour améliorer la préparation et l'action de, de santé publique. Nous approuvons son extension des, des directrices des directives principales. Je voulais aussi sincèrement présenter les condoléances au peuple comorien, du peuple comorien, aux familles des victimes, au gouvernement de Sierra Leone pour la, pour la stratégie pour la tragédie de ces derniers jours. Comme vous le savez, l'Union des Comores est un pays volcanique et fait partie des petits états insulaires fragiles en développement exposés aux aléas de changements climatiques, aux cyclones, tsunamis, aux risques environnementaux potentiels liés à la pollution marine et une mauvaise gestion des déchets biomédicaux qui sont le plus souvent mélangés aux ordures ménagères pour se retrouver dans des dépôts sauvages à l'intérieur de grandes villes. En l'absence de mesures d'hygiène et d'assainissement de base et un contrôle sanitaire adéquat, il faut ajouter à ces problèmes le manque quasi total du système de drainage et de vaccination des eaux souillées. Notre pays a conduit avec succès la mission d'évaluation externe conjointe de la mise en œuvre des capacités du règlement sanitaire international 2005 du 21 au 25 août dernier, ce qui a permis d'évaluer la capacité nationale à prévenir, détecter et riposter rapidement aux menaces pour la santé publique grâce à l'appui technique du secrétariat de l'OMS, du bureau régional, de la FAO, de l'Organisation mondiale de santé animale, de l'initiative du programme mondial de sécurité sanitaire, des gouvernements du Sénégal, Mauritanie, Mali, Madagascar, pour la mise à disposition des experts de l'Allemagne et de la Finlande, pour leur appui financier que je voudrais remercier pour cette collaboration efficace. Il, essor, il, essor, il ressort de l'évaluation. Le pays dispose d'un ensemble de textes réglementaires encadrant la surveillance et la riposte lui permettant d'appliquer le RSI. Des mécanismes de collaboration intersectorielle pour la détection et réponse aux événements de santé publique existent. Le programme national élargi de vaccination est efficace et permet une bonne couverture pour la rougeole notamment. Les ressources humaines en santé humaine et animale sont disponibles au niveau central et régional les effectifs restent insuffisants dans la plupart des secteurs. Il existe une direction de la promotion de la santé qui coordonne les activités de communication en matière des urgences de santé publique. L'Union des Comores a mis en place un dispositif de gestion des risques et de catastrophes et dispose d'un centre de coordination des opérations de secours et préparation nommé COSEP avec une cellule de veille et d'alerte précoce. Cependant, les défis majeurs restent à relever en vue de renforcer les capacités requises aux, aux événements de santé publique. L'insuffisance de coordination multisectorielle, le manque de procédures écrites et de documentation, les capacités du, du système national de laboratoire liées aux épidémies, aux zoonoses, à la sécurité sanitaire des aliments et aux risques chimiques, les capacités de pays à gérer la résistance aux antimicrobiens sont, sont pratiquement inexistantes. Les dispositifs de surveillance et de riposte aux événements liés à la sécurité sanitaire des aliments est faible. Ainsi, à l'issue de cette évaluation externe, dans les prochains jours, avec l'appui technique et financier des partenaires du bureau régional et des États membres du gouvernement de l'Union des Comores, s'engage de prendre des actions pour la mise en œuvre des mesures prioritaires identifiées par le domaine, notamment l'élaboration du plan national opérationnel multidanger en cas d'urgence de santé publique, des procédures opératoires, 
des mécanismes de coordination intersectorielle associés à l'élaboration du plan national d'action, prenant en compte les résultats de l'évaluation externe et d'autres évaluations récentes selon l'approche une, une seule santé. L'Union des Comores soutient le document et demande à l'assistante de l'adopter. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Merci, uh, Comoros, pour soutenir le document. Um, Ghana, Ghana, vous avez le floor. Merci, Chair. La délégation de Ghana, again, welcomes the comprehensive report prepared by the Secretariat. We commend all efforts undertaken by the WHO Secretariat and various funding agencies to ensure that member states of the African region implement the international health regulations. Mr. Chair, Ghana, like many member states in the Africa region, requested for an extension in the development of national coal capacities in line with the international health regulations. Now, I'm pleased to inform you that Ghana has started streams of work on zoonotic diseases, biosafety and biosecurity, immunization, national laboratory system, real-time surveillance in human and animals, workforce development, emergency response preparedness, establishment of routine capacities, and effective public health response at points of entry, etc. Some work has also started on antimicrobial resistance, but yet to be streamlined and completed. Ghana completed an initial country assessment, self-assessment, and a joint external evaluation was concluded in February 2017 with WHO and other health partners. A final report of the assessors was received and shared with key stakeholders, and plans are far advanced towards the preparation of a national action plan for health security, which is scheduled for October 2017. Ghana has also formed regional emergency response teams sourced from across sectoral agencies at the regional and district levels. These teams were fulcrums in addressing the outbreak of CSM and immunococal meningitis in the northern region and western region, respectively. The importance of the international health regulations cannot be overemphasized, Chair. And being the continent with a substantial number of outbreaks, I believe we will all see the impetus for development of national core capacities and its implementation. On this note, Ghana wishes to encourage the WHO Secretariat to continue to strengthen its level of technical assistance to the African member states. We look forward to further engagement on this subject. I thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ghana, for emphasizing the need for more technical support to African countries from WHO. Uh, Uganda, Uganda, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. Chair, Uganda welcomes the consultations on the draft five-year strategy and its guiding principles and pillars to strengthen capacities at the global, regional, and country levels to prepare for, detect, assess, and respond to public health risks and emergencies with the potential for international spread. We note the usefulness of the joint external evaluation in preparing countries to develop and implement core capacities required by the Arch International Health Regulations 2005, but call for fairness and prayer evaluation of health system strength and resilience in using the GEE. The JEE as a precondition for financial and technical support for implementing the international health regulations. Member States Chair should prioritize self-evaluation and reporting, peer review and support in development and strengthening and the maintenance of the international health regulation core capacities. Lastly, colleagues, Uganda will host the fourth annual Global Health 
Security Agenda High Level Ministerial Meeting on the 25th to 27th October 2017 in Kampala to discuss and showcase the African region's commitment to implementing the international health regulations. This meeting will be held under the theme Health Security for All, engaging communities, non-governmental actors, and the private sector. We have invited all of you, colleagues, and your counterparts in other sectors, as you know, in dealing with these health emergencies, we can't work alone as a health sector. We need to work in a multi-sectoral manner. So the meeting's objectives will be building the country ownership and promoting integration of the health security into routine national, subnational, and community programs, uh, developing a framework for engaging non-governmental stakeholders in the global health security agenda including the private sector, and sharing best practices for sustaining global health security programs at national, subnational, and community levels. And this meeting, Chair, will give honorable ministers from all the world, 194 member states, partners, and stakeholders, a collective multi-sectoral pl platform to dialogue on the current state of the global security preparedness, and also build consensus on the important aspects that we all would like to see while implementing our plans and monitoring the framework for the global strategy. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Minister Opendi, we, for reminding us about this very important meeting in October um, in, 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 in Senegal. Uganda. Uh, Senegal? Thank you. Senegal. You have the floor. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président, de nous avoir donné cette opportunité de contribuer à ce débat. Puisque, comme vous le savez, le Sénégal a réalisé en novembre passé l'évaluation externe conjointe de ses capacités pour le RSI 2005 et vient de valider son plan national de sécurité sanitaire 2017 euh, la semaine passée. À ce titre, Après examen du projet de plan stratégique mondial quinquennal pour améliorer la préparation et l'action de santé publique, nos suggestions reposent sur les leçons apprises durant le processus de planification de l'auto-évaluation, de l'évaluation externe du RSI, mais aussi d'élaboration de son plan national de sécurité sanitaire pour le renforcement des capacités du pays pour améliorer ses capacités à prévenir, détecter et reposter toute menace sanitaire de portée nationale ou internationale. Ainsi, nos suggestions et contributions par rapport aux douze principes directeurs et trois piliers sur lesquels va reposer ce plan stratégique mondial quinquennal sont les suivantes. Nous voudrions insister auprès de l'OMS sur l'importance d'inciter les pays à disposer d'une plateforme de coordination multisectorielle adaptable à chaque pays, bien sûr, pour mieux faire fonctionner la collaboration intersectorielle entre les secteurs dits clés et les secteurs d'appui. Pour ce fait, le Sénégal a mis en place une plateforme de coordination dans le cadre du programme de sécurité sanitaire logé à la primature. Durant les deux phases de l'évaluation du RSI, mais aussi de l'élaboration de son plan de sécurité nationale, celle-ci a beaucoup facilité la mobilisation et la participation effective de tous les secteurs concernés selon une approche, une seule santé. Mais reconnaissons ici que si la primature assure la coordination stratégique, c'est le secteur de la santé qui en avait assuré le lead. Deuxième contribution, c'est le soutien au point focaux RSI pour la coordination technique des activités, surtout pour la préparation et la riposte en cas d'événement sanitaire de portée nationale ou internationale. Il faut savoir que le point focal RSI ne devrait pas se limiter à une personne mais plutôt une structure nationale de coordination. Et pour ce faire, le Sénégal a désigné le centre des opérations d'urgence sanitaire comme point focal et celui-ci organise régulièrement des activités de, de simulation pour tester avec la participation effective de tout le monde, mais aussi surtout la participation communautaire, les dispositifs existants pour la préparation et la riposte par rapport à d'éventuelles menaces de santé et de porte nationale ou internationale. Par rapport au cadre de surévaluation, il nous paraît essentiel pour réaliser et suivre les progrès 
escompté dans les capacités requises et pour pérenniser les acquis, il faut que ce cadre soit bien structuré autour d'indicateurs pertinents d'extrait, d'effet et d'impact par rapport aux quatre risques spécifiques visés par le RSI. Je veux parler du risque biologique en rapport avec les zoonoses, les événements liés à la sécurité sanitaire, les aliments, la résistance antimicrobienne, mais par rapport aux risques chimiques, radiologiques et nucléaires. Enfin, par rapport au financement pérenne des plans nationaux de, de sécurité sanitaire, l'OMS devra apporter un soutien plus soutenu aux États pour la mobilisation accrue des ressources domestiques par, par exemple, l'organisation de forums. Mais aussi, il est important que les partenaires intérieurs et extérieurs continuent également d'accompagner fortement nos pays pour améliorer nos systèmes de santé. Et la dernière contribution a trait au renforcement des capacités des laboratoires mais aussi au renforcement des capacités des ressources humaines en quantité et en qualité, puisque cela devrait être parmi les axes majeurs du plan stratégique mondial quinquennal, qui, ce qui construit un, un, un talon d'Achille pour permettre nos systèmes de santé d'être mieux préparés pour faire face à ces menaces. En conclusion, le Sénégal souligne la qualité des rapports qui est très exclusif, présenté par le secrétariat, et renouvelle sa disponibilité aux besoins à participer au processus de consultation future à ce sujet. Merci, Monsieur le Président, pour la parole accordée. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Merci, uh, Sénégal, pour uh, emphasiser en particulier le sujet de l'in-country multisectoral plateforme pour uh, soutenir ça et pour avoir les ministres de la santé ou les ministres de la santé comme leaders dans cette approche multisectorale. Sud-Africa, Sud-Africa, le floor. Thank you, Chairperson. South Africa would also like to thank the Secretariat for the draft five-year global strategic plan to improve public health preparedness and response. As a consultation for member states uh, presented here today, and, and Chairperson, I think the Secretariat has correctly said they want our responses and comments on the 12 guiding principles and the three pillars. To me, Chairperson, the, the, the heartbeat of you know, the success of this whole plan will lie firstly on principle, guiding principle number five, the, the issue of intersectoral approach, which uh, Senegal has also mentioned. I'm not undermining the others, but I'm just saying to me, in my understanding and experience, the, the guiding principle number five, where it says responding to public health risk, events and emergencies require a multi-sectoral coordinated approach. And as an example of who must be in the sect and multi-sectoral approach, they could agriculture, transport, tourism and finance. May I ask Chairperson that we specifically add home affairs and foreign affairs because they are very key. I know these are examples, but I want us to emphasize on those, and I will explain later why I believe this is extremely important. The, the second issue on the, on the heartbeat of the success of this is pillar number two, item D, and I, I want to read the chairperson. It says, a critical element for the optimal functioning of the global alert and what, what, what page, sorry? Page 10. Thank you. Yes, uh, that is on page 10, pillar number two, principle number D. It says a critical element for the optimal functioning of the global alert and response system is compliance by state parties with the requirements of the regulations in relation to health measures taken in response to public health risks and events, including during public health emergencies. Chairperson, I am disturbed by noise from my right and I can't hear myself. You are protected. My thinking process, please protect You are protected. Uh, yes. Noise from the right, his right is this side, but there yes, seems please. to be... Please, can we... Yeah, it, it, it says a critical element for the optimal functioning of the global alert and response system is compliance by state parties with the requirements of the regulations 
in relation to health measures taken in response to public health risks and events, including during public health emergencies of international concerns. Let, let me not read the rest uh, in order to save time. I, I'm, I'm quoting this guiding principle number five and this pillar number two D, chairperson, because this is on paper. But in real life, this is not what usually happens. Or if I have to be precise, in our real political life, this doesn't, yes, this doesn't usually happen. I, I I'll tell you why, Chairperson, because this worries me. Some of us have gone through very disheartening experiences during major events. I'll quote, for instance, the, the, the World Cup in South Africa, which you experienced but also other events, Africa Cup of Nations or other events during uh, tourism conferences that usually take place in our countries. These events are, are prepared usually many years in advance and everybody knows the requirements. But my everyday experience is that people will come with requirements that are demanded by home affairs or foreign affairs. The requirements demanded by health are usually taken as a joke. Yes, they are completely ignored. As a minister of health, you get a phone call from your counterparts, either a minister of home affairs, foreign affairs, or tourism, instructing you, not even asking you, instructing you to please lessen some of the requirements that are wanted because if you don't do so you are going to destroy tourism or you are going to destroy diplomatic relations with a particular country and so please relax this 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 regulations and of course when you resist you are regarded as unreasonable or as not understanding world affairs very well. And, and this chairperson happens all the time. Now, I want to emphasize that we must understand that these organisms that are annihilating human beings do not understand uh, diplomacy at all, nor do they care about it. And I'm not saying diplomacy is not important. And I do hope because the Director General has served in both. Uh, Director General Dr. Tetros has been a Minister of Foreign Affairs and has been a Minister of Health. He's now at the helm of these regulations. I'm sure he will be of help to Mary, uh, uh, the two, to make them understand that diplomatic relations, tourism, and health are not mutually exclusive. Actually, actually, if international health regulations are not being obeyed in particular countries or are not being respected, it can actually destroy tourism in on that particular country. So it's actually the other way around. And I want this chairperson at BG to take it very seriously. It happens quite often and we have experienced it. And you very reluctantly, knowing very well that is wrong, relax these regulations and just pray and hope nothing will happen. I don't want to depend on prayer on this issue. The second issue I want to mention, Chairperson, is that I, I, I the, the, as I've noted in my response to the regional director's report uh, on Monday, the G20 health ministers focus on strategies to better manage global health crisis. And I want to quote because this is very important from the G20 declaration, uh, Ber what is called Berlin Declaration, taken on the 20th of May, 2017, and I open quote, we acknowledge that efficient global health crisis management can only be ensured through compliance with international health regulations. We will act accordingly within our obligations under the international health regulation and support the leadership and coordination of the World Health Organization in the event of health crisis of international concern, we also recognize the importance of development and supporting national plans 
to strengthen health systems and building the core capacities required under international health regulations and providing technical assistance to address critical gaps identified. I close quotes. Lastly, Chairperson, uh, Honorable Ministers and Head of Delegation, I quoted from this Berlin Declaration because I want to encourage WHO to work very closely with member states of G20 because they have put up this declaration to try and help us on how to better deal with international health regulations. I was lucky to have attended this conference, this G20 conference, which was a, a minister's conference prior to the main or the real G20 of, of heads of state. And during this conference, Chairperson, there was a simulation exercise which was demonstrated to us. And it was led by World Health Organization and the World Bank. During the simulation exercise, questions were put on the screen and participants were supposed to answer them. The questions was about what do you do in the event of such and such happening? And the, the questions were forcing you to think carefully. For instance, they were touching on the economy, on tourism, on diplomacy, and good neighborliness. What do you do if there is an international health emergency in your neighbor's country and you have to take decisions? which will affect tourism, economy, and diplomacy. And this is an emergency. I, I found that very useful. And Chairperson, I will then like by ending by asking the regional director through the WHO head office to facilitate an exercise like this for us in our continent. Because in my experience, this issue of throwing away international health regulations uh, 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 trading them for diplomacy and good neighborliness. It happens more in our continent than in other parts of the world. Thank you very much. Yes, I would like to thank the Honorable Aaron Masoledi for his very pertinent comments. And uh, again, uh, the issue of, uh, you are right, about uh, health uh, being taken as a joke by some of our, our colleagues and we, you know, there's some times where we require aeroplanes to be sprayed when you go from one country to the other for, for mosquitoes. And, and often uh, the people in the planes will say, well, I know, no, it's, it's people will sneeze or, uh, no, it's not very useful. Uh, we've already sprayed. We sprayed two weeks ago. So, yes, yeah, it's, you're right. You're not taken seriously. So, uh, uh, the, the, Director General, you've got a real challenge to assist here. And also the G20, to look at how we can collaborate strongly with the G20. And the learning exercise for the, for the Africa region that has been proposed here, to, to learn uh, and absorb some of the practical challenges that we face. Thank you, South Africa. Um, o'clock. It's time for a break. But according to my list, and we've not made it, um, I've got two, four, six, seven countries still wanting to speak, and then we'll have a response from the Secretariat. So really, we should have a break for, for tea. But meanwhile, I'll give this time to my permanent secretary, Dr. Gwinji. Thank you, Honorable Minister, Chair. Um, Honorable Ministers and days of delegation, I think we are now halfway through our period here and we have really enjoyed the stay and participation of our Director General. It's a busy office where he's coming from, and I think you'll have a number of engagements that are now calling him back. So we would like to appreciate uh, his coming over and being with us in the very first regional committee meeting that he has witnessed. And to extend our token of appreciation to him, may I invite the Honorable Chair uh, of the Committee to please present a gift or token of appreciation to the Director General.
No, thank you. Thank you so much for this beautiful uh, token uh, with uh, Minister Perenyatwa. I said it well now. <laughs> with Minister, uh, with my brother David, uh, we have been to the Victoria Falls uh, this morning. And I had actually captured uh, not only the fall, but a very nice. Um, rainbow on the side of it and I tweeted it saying good morning from Victoria Falls Zimbabwe and this token actually fits well with the beautiful thing I have seen this morning uh, and I'm really uh, happy that the two actually align and one of the tweets in response to my tweet I say I so was which says it's good you made this message straight because some, some people think that Victoria Falls is in South Africa. So. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, thank you so much. And thank you so much also for the excellent engagement and all the discussions we had and look forward to working with you very, very closely. I will be heading back in just one hour or so, and look forward to keep in touch with you. Uh, please call me, pick up the phone and call me, anything you would like to discuss with me. I am just very close and a call or a text away. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, again. Thank you Honorable Ministers. I think we can break for tea. Thank you. Before you break for tea, Let's make it clear that we come back here at half past. Please, half past, uh, we come back and we 